Thank you, Jyoti. Um, again, I want to thank for the invitation to Sydney. It's great to be here. Um, as Jyoti mentioned, the title has been changed and the theme. The theme in the printed program has nothing or very little to do with water. Uh, there is some flow in it, but uh, but um, I decided yesterday to completely shift course and uh, to focus on wetlands, which is uh, both gives me the opportunity to discuss flows and 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 water and and sort of align with the other papers in the session. I've been engaged in, in a project on wetlands for several years. It's one of my several projects and, and interests, and I have uh, three graduate students working on uh, the representation of wetlands in, in uh, visual arts, in literature, in, in uh, geographical maps, and things like that. So uh, this is not new to me, and in fact, I published a paper almost with the exact paper, with the exact uh, uh, title, with a, a colleague, a, an Icelandic colleague, uh, Edward Huybens. Um, so, I'll present a few uh, images from uh, Icelandic wetlands. Photography is one of my hobbies, and uh, I play with images. And here's one of them from South Iceland. Uh, and uh, there's always a biographical element and why on earth would I be interested in wetlands and I think there's a simple explanation uh, as a kid from the age of 6 to 12 I spent the summers in the Icelandic countryside with relatives in uh, an ecosystem which uh, is very much like this one very wet and, and I think that uh, my childhood memories uh, have uh, brought me to this theme. Okay, and the title, of course, is borrowed from Henry David Thoreau. It is in vain to dream of a wilderness distant from ourselves. There is none such. It is the bog in our brain and bowels, the primitive vigor of nature in us that inspires that dream. Again, maybe that's my childhood. Um, <clears throat> I might mention that uh, for the last 10 years, or 15 years, I've been exploring biomedicine, uh, as Jody mentioned, and I've, I've published on uh, biobanks and similar issues. And this is the company Deco Genetics uh, on the margin of the campus in Reykjavik. It's, it's a big biotech company. And interestingly, in front of the fancy building, there is a, an artificial wetland. It's a piece of art commissioned um, by a well-known artist, Olavur Eliasson, Danish Icelandic background. And, and it was interesting to combine these two interests of mine, the biomedicine and, and wetlands, in the same slot, so to speak. The artificial wetland is now uh, uh, the home of birds and they nest and, and, and thrive in the, uh, at the front of the biomedical building. Here is uh, another piece of art by the same artist, Olavur Eliasson, and it's interesting, it's reverse waterfall, and it occurred to me when I read Zoe's abstract the, the point that uh, power and water run in different directions, maybe the artist is precisely making that point. I mean, here, water and power run finally in the same direction. So water is pushed up. Uh, the art, same artist made uh, a famous piece of art in one of the bridges of New York City by channeling water uh, through the bridge somehow. And, and down in the Hudson River, I presume. Um, and I interestingly, there's lots of Icelandic arts uh, playing with, with water, waterfalls, etc. Here's Iceland, 
and the reddish dots indicate wetlands. Uh, much of the interior is desert, desert and, and uh, glaciers and sand, but uh, the coastline is either, either grassy uh, or wetlands. And uh, I spent the summers way south in a place called Landeyjar. It means literally islands on land, so it, it says something about uh, wetlands. And I was born and raised on a tiny island south of the coast, the Westman Isles, so it was close by. So there are two very interesting wetland, three very interesting, Miva in the way north is a fantastic site of bird life and wetlands, and Thjorsarver, more in the wild interior, a contested site uh, for environmentalists today, and then Flowey, which I'll say something about uh, in the south. This is from the Thjorsarver in the middle, uh, just to indicate the the uh, context. This is Miva in the north. Uh, the archaeologists have recently discovered uh, medieval iron, which is a product of wetlands. So apparently uh, the Viking Age produced weapons and iron from wetlands, so it wasn't just uh, something to avoid, but on the contrary, something to exploit. Uh, again, this is scenery from uh, Miwa, which happens to be a popular place for tourists. Uh, same scene. Nearby in eastern Iceland. And wetlands were discussed by early foreign travelers uh, in the 19th century. Uh, uh, a guy from California visited uh, North Iceland, I think, and drew up this picture. And uh, the Icelandic guides uh, managed to uh, take him uh, sort of uh, uh, a detour around the wetlands, otherwise he would have been stuck in it. And he couldn't understand why he couldn't simply go straight. And one of the things I've been interested in is the representation of wetlands in maps. This is a Danish map making tradition. Iceland was a Danish colony until 1918. And here you have the shift from uh, Mars to fields. And wetlands were an endless hindrance to travel and, and to uh, agriculture, farming, and in, in this small scale peasant context. And uh, there's lots of mythology and literature. And somehow people wanted to manage the flow and get rid of the water to maximize productivity of, of the land. And uh, there's a similar discourse in many, many other contexts, no doubt here as well. And by the way, this uh, wetlands are a huge international theme. Wetlands cover a substantial part of the globe and the ecological productivity of wetland is, is immense and the connection with bird life uh, and the sort of purification of water and, and the rest of it. So it's, it, this is not trivial. This is, uh, and it's been uh, calculated that uh, wetlands contain uh, many of the gases we want to avoid and uh, if you get rid of wetlands, which has been the modernist policy throughout the world, then, then you release these gases and, and global warming will be a, a bigger problem. So there are good grounds uh, and Icelandic ecologists have been involved in these studies and there are good grounds for, for maintaining wetlands. Here is uh, again the southwest part of Iceland, close to where I stayed as a child. And I have some more to say about that. Here's an engineering project in the early 20th century from that part. And uh, 
uh, it was partly Danish engineers and, and they laid out this massive irrigation scheme. Uh, this is artificial channels and the point was to, to channel uh, water from the top corner in the right down to the coast on the left and to, to enable every peasant or farmer to, to manage the water on her, his or her land, either to increase it or to decrease it. And it was extremely costly and a typical modernist state thing in early 20th century. And I'm often reminded of uh, James Scott's book, uh, Seeing Like a State. It's a brilliant example of, of the modernist uh, scheme and, and its failures. Once this project was done, it was obsolete because farming had been uh, thoroughly changed anyway by mechanics, a different uh, sort of kind of agriculture. Uh, but uh, this had huge implications for farmers in the, in the area and lots of politics. Here is the major channel which, is, which was stuck with basically hands in early 20th century. Uh, uh, but this channel, like a river, pulled the waters from the neighborhood and, and channeled the whole thing to the coast. And again, examples of the uh, channels. And uh, if you fly over Iceland, you will see these uh, channels uh, everywhere, They're like sort of uh, mapping the, the land. Uh, uh, um, and they changed the scenery visually, and one of the arguments now is uh, this is uh, ugly. It's not the, the aesthetics of, of the land has been violated. Here's a local farmer, a classmate of mine from gymnasium or secondary grammar school, whatever you call it, uh, explaining to me what this meant to him and his family. There are bogs everywhere in the south, and, and some of them have been reclaimed in, in, in the recent year, partly as a result of the environmental movement. This is in the eastern part of the country, one valley or firth, and there was a massive effort to, to dry it up, and, and uh, it was costly for the state. Once it had been completed, every farmer left for the city. Uh, again, these are examples of the modernist and, and the failures. There's erosion as well. And this is the main channel in the, in the region where I stayed as a kid. Uh, and this runs parallel to the coast. It's a massive uh, uh, channel. Nowadays, uh, tourism has caught on uh, exploiting the wetlands, if you like. And this is one site in, in the south, a place called Stockseri. And you can uh, rent a canoe or kayak and, and spend the day. Um, so again, one of the reasons to, to maintain the wetlands is for tourism, just for the visual pleasure, for bird life and for, for containing the gases, uh, maintaining the flow. What is to be done? Uh, and this is from Scott. The grand schemes of the government are based on the solid belief in linear progress, the development of science and technology, the sensible molding of society, the ultimate satisfaction to all human needs, and last but not least, man's total domination over nature, including human nature in accordance with the laws of nature and the understanding of science. Typically, the modernist uh, position outlined by, by Scott in uh, Seeing Like a State. Um, there's been lots of discussion of the Anthropocene and uh, the wetlands uh, come into this discussion uh, and it, we might ask uh, exactly when did humans start to think that there was a problem, a global problem with the environment. and, and uh, 
this is from a paper which I introduced yesterday as part of the European Science Foundation Rescue Project, uh, a group that worked on the notion of the Anthropocene and refashioning Anthropos for the modern world. And if, if, if anyone is interested, I have a copy of the paper. Uh, it should be published uh, soon. But in 1864, George Perkins Marsh said, the earth is fast becoming an unfit home for its noblest inhabitants. And I'm sure all of us know who the noblest inhabitants are, and there may not be uh, agreement with, with George today. In uh, 1984, Fairfield Osborne said, it is man's earth now. Again, it's a, uh, it's a restricted code. It's man's uh, sexist uh, language. One wonders what obligations may accompany this infinite possession. Now, there's a growing sense that humans are faced with a narrowing wind of, of opportunity. If we do not act very soon, it will be too late. And this is an issue we discussed partly yesterday. And wetlands are uh, a big part of the equation. How would we, how should we manage the flow of wetlands? And, uh, and the problems with water are massive. Uh, there is global warming, uh, the glaciers are melting, and, and the sea levels are rising, and uh, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, much faster than, than we anticipated, and, and the news are shocking uh, uh, for inhabitants of coastal communities throughout the world. The permafrost is melting in the north and uh, posing special problems for Inuit con communities. Uh, so we have to organize ourselves. And this is a title from a well-known song by Dylan. You better start swimming or you sink like a fool. <laughs> and that's precisely our context. And we need to manage water and swim. Um, a massive collaborative research effort is, is needed on the global level, and we need to reorganize centers of learning, establishing interdisciplinary networks and institutions on the regional and global level. Uh, given the central role of human activity, it is vitally important to study human environmental interactions on a much grander scale than ever before. Uh, this is not just, however, uh, a question of, of more funding. We need to refashion our take and uh, the final point, uh, a radical effort to reframe the human, to redress the balance, and to escalate funding for the social sciences and the humanities. This is absolutely essential. And, and it's uh, nice to see uh, institutions and labels and departments uh, named and environmental humanities and even a journal uh, based here with uh, one issue already published. I learned yesterday. And, and browse through it on my computer in the morning. There's a new institute in, in uh, being developed in the Stockholm University, and, and uh, it's a Californian thing as well. So it's coming all over the place, and, and it is timely. And it's unfortunately, I don't know, maybe 90% of the environmental research budget globally goes into natural and medical sciences. No doubt the money is needed there. But it's ironic at a moment in history when humans are fundamentally revising the ecosystem everywhere, the global situation, global warming and the rest of it. Our signatures are everywhere. It's ironic that we cannot have more funding for the fields that would precisely deal with the human impact and the human role in the, in the Anthropocene. And, and, and uh, that's precisely what is needed. And thanks. Thank <laughs> you.